Tonight, Sunday, October 27th. The greatest exposition in the world, the New York World's Fair, comes to an end. Many words could be said, many speeches made about the dignity and nobility of this fair, about the historic events that took place on its grounds during the last few years, and about the millions of individual attractions which lured visitors from all over the earth. But when a happy ending comes to anything, it's not customary to sit silently amid memory. And tonight on the fairgrounds, thousands of people are celebrating this last evening in the greatest tradition of carnival holiday, making merry in the hardest way they know how. Keeping to this spirit, the members of WOR Special Features Division are tonight going to try to do at the fair the individual things they've always wanted to do, broadcasting a description of it as they do it. Some of these things, we should warn you in advance, might sound a little bit wild. But really, there's no harm meant, and any misinterpretation is purely coincidental. But now, without further explanation, and to show you just what we mean, we're going directly out to the fairgrounds and to our ringleader there, Henry Morgan. Ringleader? And freezing. Oh, my, why did I ever get into this? I don't know. They, they sold me a bill of goods, that's all. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll tell you what the plot is as, as quickly and as easily as I can before my teeth fall out. It's cold, do you gather what I mean? It's cold. Uh, we got into the American Jubilee by what is commonly known as hook or and crook, and we had to use both. We gave the manager a big song and dance, and somehow or other we got beyond him, and now I've worked my way to where I'm backstage at the American Jubilee. You can hear the PA system, perhaps, and the band in the background, and this is what happened to me. They made me get into a, a sailor suit, and I'm standing here in a sailor suit, which is what I understand they wear in the finale, and I've got to get on that stage and sing a song. Got to. I've wanted it for two years. And tonight, I'm going to use that same hook and crook once more and get on that stage and sing my song. Now, uh, the, the problem is, I've talked to a couple of stagehands and everything, and they just looked at me with what is known as the jaundice. And uh, I haven't gotten the base one as yet, but maybe I can get myself a little information. Wait a minute, here's somebody. Somebody in the cast ought to be able to tell me something or other. Um, perhaps, you're Lucy Monroe, aren't you? I sure am. Miss Monroe? I'm afraid, though. No, don't be afraid. Gee, I would. <laughs> oh, I'm not afraid. Lots of girls would like to be Lucy Monroe. You're the star of the show. Well, I don't know about that. I'm Jenny like... Lynn. How do you... In the show, I know. I've seen it eight times, and I want to go and be part of it. I've got to be part of it. Look at me, sailor suit. Oh, Cute? you look simply superb. Did you ever see a sailor look like this in your life? You look terrific. Hey, look, you're... And you're the best a... looking sailor here. Why, thank you very much. Broadcast <laughs> over. Morgan's going into... <laughs> no, not... You've the Navy at once. Look, tell me something. Wait, come in the dressing room where you got the heater. I got a plot, I see? Freeze. I got a plot. Listen, now that we're in the dressing room, we are. All uh, right, we're alone. We're <laughs> I'll see you at 12 o'clock as soon as we're off the air. Miss Monroe, yes. uh, tell me, I've got to get on stage for the finale. Yeah. And people being a little, not tough about it, but a little lackadaisical. And they won't give me a chance. Not, not, a, not a reasonable one, too. You're in the cast. How am I going to get out on stage? Can I go out with you? Well, uh, uh, of course, lots of ways of getting on stage. I mean, uh... Yeah, but I don't know which one to try first. Well, uh, you can come out with me if you want to. I mean, I go out and sing the Fast Angle Family. You could come on and stand. Wait, and... are there sailors in that number? Sure, there are. Do they, do they look like me? They certainly do. It's the not same... good. Oh, Miss Monroe, this is delightful. I love to start a broadcast this way. Let me see how it ends up. Isn't it friendly? I tell you what, look. <laughs> Let me tell you what we're doing. You don't seem at all surprised, but I know there's so many people who walk around this joint in costume that you're not quite there in are it. so many wax, one more. We have, uh, good evening. We have um, five other WOR wax out here at the fair covering various things. Yes. And I think I'm doing the best of all of them. <laughs> I'm sure of it. I don't know. Uh, I haven't just... seen the five others, but I... Well, you'll hear from them on our portable radio. So just for the sake of a gag, uh, Mr. Fitzgerald, am I interrupting you? Uh, my piratical friend, you're not. If you think you're not funny in that sailor suit, I'm laughing. <laughs> Well, neighbors, this is the closing night at the New York World's Fair, which differs considerably from this night. The exhibit closed last season. Then it was chill, rainy, and not many cash customers were present. Those who did make an appearance were in a highly festive mood, and that goes double for tonight. Several members of the crew out here on this assignment helped open this shindig two years ago. Messrs. Driscoll, Danzig, and myself. In the days between, it was my good fortune to act as the official World's Fair radio reporter for two seasons. In that time, I have followed the activities with more than average interest. But never once have I envied the original great white father of these headache acres. I never wanted to eat a lavish lunch every day in Perlon Hall and afterwards snooze in the hot sun at the court of peace as the great ones of the earth spoke of peace and goodwill. The barkers fascinated me and the bathing bells of the aquacade charmed me. The good food added to my waistline and dulled what I like to call my wits. 
But all those brave days and happy nights, I had a yen, a secret ambition, a suppressed desire. I wanted to drive one of those electric carts operated so efficiently by the American Express Company. I wanted to sit at the controls and drive my tiny juggernaut right smack at the visitors to see them jump and to laugh scornfully at the blistering invective hurled. So here we are, out here on the midway of the amusement sector, with little goody two-shoes driving fearlessly through this hilarious mob of good-time Charlies. And I hope I remember how to shut this contraption off. But if not, sue me. I'm a shin-barking, rootin', tootin' son of a gun. Come on, toots, move your hips. Here I come! And there's the Frozen Alive building. There are several times every day for the past two seasons, they used to freeze a brace of fair and innocent daughters of Eve in a cake of ice. But we have some visitors here. I think I'll turn the mic over to this citizen. Will you tell us your name, sir? Uh, Morris Kaplan. Where are you from, Morris? I'm from Poughkeepsie, New York. What are you doing down here? Oh, I'm seeing a World Fair out. Ah. And you, sir, uh, uh, may, you, uh, may I ask you how you spell your name, Mr. Kaplan? Why, uh, K-A-P-L-A-N. But uh, tell me, uh, Ed, uh, how do you pronounce your name? Is it Fitzgerald or Fitzgerald? Oh, just call me Snake Eye. Okay. And you, sir, will you tell me your name? David Torpy. Where are you from, Dave? Uh, Brooklyn, uh, Mr. Fitzgerald. What do you do for a living? Well, I'm a guide out here. A guide? I've been for two years. I see. And have you any suppressed desires tonight? Well, yes, Mr. Fitzgerald. Now that you bring that up, what would you like to do? Well, I'd like to ask you a question. You would? Well, go ahead, shoot, kid. How's your sacroiliac? How do you spell it? I don't know. I'm a stranger around here myself. Wow! And there's Carl. There's W.O.R.'s announcer, Carl Warren, doing the barking and getting away with his personal ambition. That Bridgeport bunny is up to no good. Hey, driver, we've killed enough people for this evening with this chair. So let's tally a while and see what Mr. Warren is barking about. Lend an ear, neighbors. Lend an ear. A show the lack of which you've never before seen. A show never before presented to amusement seekers at this or any other fair. Frozen alive. Frozen alive. Hurry, 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 and get your tickets for thrills and chills, for spine-tingling, sensation-creating, nerve-shocking exposure of human beings to tons of ice. Not since the days of Galen, the wonder worker of Greek medicine who lived in the first century, ladies and gentlemen. Not since the discovery by Harvey of the fact that blood courses through the veins of our bodies has such a momentous experiment been made available to you and you and you standing out there. Frozen alive, all that the words imply. A temperature of 32 degrees Fahrenheit, of zero degrees centigrade and lower, impressed on the body of a human being whose temperature is 98 degrees plus or minus. Hold it, everybody. Hold it, everybody. They haven't even started yet. What happens? The individual is buried alive in a casing of ice which numbs and shocks and chills, reducing the blood to an incredible state. The first sensation of the individual is shock, which tapers off to a paralyzing numbness. A feeling of lassitude steals over the subject of the experiment. The desire for sleep becomes all-powerful. The drowsiness of results finally renders the human unconscious and a state of suspended animation takes place. And after that, ah, there's the question, a riddle of the ages. A problem that you can see solved by the courage and hardiness of the biped we know as Homo sapiens. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, one of the greatest feats of the year is to be attempted by a young radio executive. One Jerry Danzig, who is known to many of you who listen on the air lane. He has left his desk, coming here to the fair to be buried alive on a block of ice to serve as a human time capsule. So that the people of the year 2,540 will be able to look through frigid crystals at a perfectly preserved citizen of these United States in the year 1940. Will Jerry Danzig survive this harrowing, horrific, horrendous, horripilating experience? Our staff of doctors will be available to offer first aid to this gamester who is attempting something that far transcends a cold shower or membership in an Arctic or Antarctic expedition. That is more terrifying than the time you fell through that thin ice on the pond at home when you were just a little shaver. Man's servant ice becomes man's enemy tonight. Can Jerry Danzig survive the shock? The annoying cold that penetrates to the marrow and turns one's blood to a chilly stream? There's only one way to find out, ladies and gentlemen. These lovely little ladies standing around me here, lovely everyone, know what it takes. It takes everything a person has. Step inside and see for yourselves. The performance is about to start. Hurry, 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 and get your tickets. This show is too good to miss. Come one, come all to the greatest show on ice. Yeah! All right, Carlton. Some of the good people you've attracted with your magnificent and urgent hurry, 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 hurry are here. You never know how many friends you have until someone says that you're going to be buried alive. There are more familiar faces here than I've seen at home with my family. Well, Carlton and ladies and gentlemen, you just heard the beginning, the description of what's going to happen. Two, year, two years ago when this exhibit first opened, Dave Driscoll and I didn't believe that they really were these mountainous blocks of ice. We didn't believe that they were on the level. We thought it was done with mirrors or perhaps with chemicals, 
in some way until we came over here, until we touched them, until we practically got in them, but neither of us did. And now, tonight, now that the lid's off, well, actually, we are going to get in it. I'm speaking now from a stage which is about four and a half feet above the audience. A very large audience tonight. The attendance here at the fair, as you probably have heard, is over 500,000. They, there is on the runway here a very large block of ice, probably about seven feet long, which is hollowed, something like an Indian dugout. And over this go other additional hollow pieces that fit o- first over your feet and then over your knees and then over your chest and eventually over your head. I've got to have a little room for microphone here so that, of course, uh, we can't close it completely tightly because I've got to be able to speak. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about the young ladies here. When they come out and are put into this ice, of course, they're attired in a suggestion of a bathing suit. I'm attired in a bathing suit, the trunks and the top. These girls have, as I understand it, only two protections. One are black glasses so that the water melted by the heat of their body and dripping down on them from the top of their vault won't hurt their eyes. And the other one, the second protection, I see Ed Fitzgerald walked in to see me buried alive. Thank you, Ed. And the second protection is a towel on which they rest. Now, I'm going to play along with the rules. I've got the towel. I don't have the glasses, but I don't think I'm going to get too much water on the top of this microphone. At least I hope not. But to give you a little idea of what this is all about, from one of the ladies herself, here standing next to me is Miss Annette Delmar. Delman. Delman or Delmar? Delmar. Delmar, okay, as well. She's 24 years old, and I understand that you hold the world's record. Would you tell our audience what the world's record is? 21 minutes and 40 seconds. 21 minutes and 40 seconds. Well, I dare say that I'm not going to challenge you for your title tonight. My feet are cold. I'm standing here in bare feet, jumping up and down. Tell me uh, a couple of things more, Miss uh, Delmar. How long have you been doing this? Well, I've been doing this for the last five years now. The last five years, all over the country? All over the country. Well, now, do you ever catch cold from this ice? No, cold. Going in the ice means you stop cold. Well, that's good. Maybe I can avoid something. And uh, how long? Uh, how many shows have you played today? This is a big day here. Well, so far, we must have played about 72 shows. 72 shows. And how many times does that mean in the ice for you? Well, you can never tell. There's quite a few of the shows here, and we divide it up. When I, was, I think that this thing is only fair. Here I am standing here with a long overcoat, bare feet, the coat's up to my neck. In a minute, I'm going to have to take the darn thing off. What are, the, are there a few tricks of the trade that I ought to know? Well, when you get in, just shiver and keep your blood circulating. I'm sure you won't freeze to death then. Well, just keep, you mean the shivering keeps the blood circulating? Is that yeah, right? That's right. All right, well, then here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Now, no fooling. Uh, I'm taking my coat off. Okay, a chair from the front. We need that. <laughs> All right, here we go. Somebody give me a hand here. Okay. Oh! Oh, and there's no fooling about this. They, they're pushing me in. These girls weigh 105 pounds. I weigh 185. Woo! They're trying to get me sideways now. That isn't fair, fellas. That isn't cricket. The piece of ice is going down over my chest. I'm reclining something like Madame de Barry so that it'll fit. And I might say it is dripping. If you want to know what this sensation is like, will somebody please give me the time? I'm after the new local record. None stop. This thing is weighing on me at the moment something like uh, the, an Egyptian tomb, I think. Fortunately, nobody has quite dropped one over my head at the moment. But here I am, and it is burning. Woo! Uh, now, look. Uh, come here, Miss Delmore. I'm lying on my back, and she's crouching over to talk to me. Look, there's no room in here for me to shiver. What do I do now? I guess you just have to freeze. <laughs> just have to freeze. I don't think I'm going to be able to take these headphones off anymore. They're just going to stick. Carl Ruff is standing here next to me, grinning at me, and I don't think that's very nice. You don't have to come to work tomorrow. Just beat it. Stay away. It's something like being a sturgeon in a delicatessen window. <laughs> My mother's listening. I hope she gets the soup ready. <laughs> hey, how about your feet? What do you do with your feet? They're down there, and I don't think they're part of me anymore. <laughs> Is there anything that I can do? All right, well, now, look, uh, if you, you gentlemen will, thank you. How do you get out of this? Now I'm frozen in here, salad. Is there any way of getting out of this thing? Looks like it's just too bad, kid. The fellow with the ice pick went out for a cup of coffee, and he won't be back till the next World Fair. Oh. Well, I've had a cold shoulder before, but I've never had one like this. Pardon me, Jerry Danzig. This is Henry Morgan again, ladies and gentlemen. Still backstage at the Jubilee, and I've got to get on stage because everybody's had his wish but me. Jerry's gotten into a cake. Wait a minute, please. I'm on here. Just a minute. Jerry's got... Just a minute, please. No, wait a minute. Now, let, me, let me finish explaining it, please. I've got to get backstage. I got my uniform on. I looked at the same as the other guys. It doesn't make any difference. You're in the show? I don't see you in the show? Yeah, I'm in the show. Of course I'm in the show. You're singing this microphone. Oh, well, somebody asked me to do a broadcast. I'm sorry, you can't go back. This is the last night. I don't see why. It's the last night of the show. We could do it just one. Look, we have other guys that they let. 
Joe Dancy get frozen in a cake of ice. Yeah, that's the show, right? Cake of ice, then I call one and be a barker. Why can't I get back? I don't see what difference it makes to you. After all, I got a job to do. What are you? What are you? My man, can I put these things together? I know, but what difference does it make to you? Look, all right, all right, ladies and gentlemen, it's okay, pal. Okay, I'm your friend. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this time, no. But I get one more shot if the time lasts. I'll tell you what. We've got another guy. Al Giuseppe is over at um, 20,000 Legs Under the Sea. And Mr. J is going to try to add his two legs to the affair over there. So let's join him and see if he can crash that joint. Hey, don't, don't find that, will you? Hey. Well, Henry Morgan has tried to switch this program just a second ago over to Al Giuseppe at 20,000 Legs Under the Sea. One of the most disconcerting exhibits in the World's Fair amusement area. Those of you who visited here during the last two years will probably remember this place under one or more of its many titles. The Dream of Venus, the Underwater Swimmers, Salvador Dali's Joint, or what have you. The place is divided into two sections. One is a big tank of water with beautiful girls in various states of array and disarray swimming around while the customers ogle at them through a glass panel that forms one side of the tank. The other section is a surrealist exhibit with a girl named Venus tied asleep. She, too, can be watched by the customers on the other side of some glass. Now to come straight to the point this evening, I've always had a yen to do two things in this place. Find out what Venus dreams about and take a dive myself into the pool in which the ballet swimmers cavort. In the next few minutes, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to do both. Now, the house outside is packed this evening with customers jamming against each other in a frantic effort to watch the girls. They can't see me yet, I hope. When they do, some of them will probably faint. First of all, though, I'm going to pop out from the curtain next to the sleeping Venus's bed. I'll interview her, and then I'll climb back up a very steep ladder to the top of the pool and dive in. So now, if you'll join me, we'll go down the ladder that leads to Venus, hand over hand, like a fireman. Here we go now. All right, Excuse me, can I come in and interrupt your sleep? Certainly. What is your name? Jean Falco. Where are you from, Jean? Brooklyn. Well, is this a very hard job, sleeping here? It is. Do you sleep most of the day? No, we never sleep here. You never sleep? No. Do the customers disconcert you? No. Well, let me ask you something. What do you dream about when you do sleep? Uh, well, you think about the time when you're going to get up. Well, it's all, it's all what? Not all. That's all you think about. That's all. You don't think about the people out there at all? No, you don't. You can see them, though, can't you? Oh, yes. Well, let me describe the way uh, you're attired here. Jean's lower extremities are covered by a very satiny-looking red cloth. Her upper extremities are covered by gardenias, flowers. Now, Jean, I'm going to leave you and climb up this ladder. We only have a few minutes here and go to the pool. Thanks very much for your interview. Now, now if you'll wait just a moment, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going up this very steep ladder. It's like a fireman's ladder, as I explained, with bars... Going across. Will you take the microphone just a minute? Thanks. All right. Here I'm coming to the top, and I'm standing on a catwalk above the pool. The pool, I explained before, has about um, 50 feet or a little less of glass windows on one side. Now, I'm going to bend over here as soon as I can untangle this wire and put on my goggles. You need underwater swimming goggles for this. And interview one of the young ladies in the pool. What is your name? Is this a tough job swimming here? It's the toughest in the world. I'd rather swim 18 miles any old day. Well, will you give me a few pointers before I jump in here? About what? Well, first of all, can the people see you? Yes, and we can see the people. You can see the people. Yes. Secondly, is there any possibility of my going through the glass? I've never been in here before. The glass is circulite glass and can't be broken by anything in the world. Are there any pointers about my swimming? Should I take it easy or really do a little underwater uh, cavorting? So you tell him you better keep your legs together and don't kick. All right, thanks. Now I've got my bathing trunks on and my shirt, and here I go, ladies and gentlemen. Here I go. Whoa, what? Well, let me see if I keep this microphone out of the water. I've been down under, and it's quite an experience. I don't know just where I am because there's water got under my goggles, and I can hardly see a thing. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm in, and really the water's wonderful. Now that I'm here, in fact, I think I'll stay a while. It's so invigorating, you know, decidedly helpful and all that. 
Hello, yes, war two. That reminds me. The man that follows me on this program, Dave Driscoll, must be good and cool by now. Because he's standing out on the court of peace with a big surprise. Poor oh, Dave, cool, think of that. It's so warm in here, too. Well, I might as well turn you over to Dave, for I practice my best stroke. So long, everybody. It's been nice knowing you. Heaven can wait. And ladies and gentlemen, if you don't think that Alvin Giuseppe was down in that water, you can take my word for it, because while I wasn't there, I recognized, along with our engineers, the sound of that hum on the wire, which meant that his microphone was sopping wet. But here are we in the court of peace. Ever since the New York Wells Fair opened in 1939, I've had a wild desire to make a real speech from this now famous platform in the court of peace. When the exposition closed in the fall of last year, I made some remarks from this point, but they didn't constitute a real speech. After all, I said that uh, if one were to lay all of the useless adjectives that had been uttered here and laid them one end to end, he could just about run around the world on them several times. And I also said that uh, the discarded gardenias that lay beneath the platform here constituted a real problem. That was on Halloween night, 1939. The fair still had another season before. Tonight is almost Halloween, 1940. And the fair is almost all over. Today, that is, until 11 p.m. New York time, 531,962 persons entered the gates of this great show. And that surpasses anything in the history of all world expositions. A regular fee of 50 cents was charged throughout the day. And you figure it out for yourself. The greatest day in the past history of the World's Fair was September 3rd, 1939, when a total of 492,446, to be exact, paid their way in. And that was on Labor Day weekend last year. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I have arrived at the great moment. I've waited two years for it. The greatest crowd the fair has ever had. The greatest crowd the city of New York has ever seen. And here I am, right in the middle of the New York World's Fair, in the court of peace, and there's nobody here but us goblins. <laughs> well, they're laughing. There must be two or three of them out here. And so to the speech, ladies and gentlemen, and we will... Please uh, understand that there are six or eight people out here, or half a dozen who've come out, along with the radio staff of the New York Wells Fair, which has been so kind to us during these past two years. And they're out here to partake in the fun. So then, to my prepared speech, and I give it to you garbed in top hat, a size 52 swallowtail, no gardenia, if you please, but a chrysanthemum. And so here we go. As if someone handed me the speech and I walked up here, which they did, like they did for two years during the World's Fair. Ladies and gentlemen, on this the last evening of New York's most breathtaking show, the World's Fair 1940, the world of tomorrow, I speak to you from the Court of Peace. Before me are thousands of seats, but not a soul sits here. It's an awesome yet an eerie sight. Here for the first two seasons congregated thousands of Americans. From the four corners of the United States of America, yes, and countless citizens of other nations who came from afar to see and study our way of life. These thousands met in this, the largest place of assembly at the fair, decorated by the flags of all nations. Here they heard presidents, statesmen, colonies, Waylands, Finasteries, brethren, and nobility. They heard great music played by the world's most grumble musicians conducted by internationally fleeing Gibson conductors. When the history of the past two years is written, no socially-minded writer or commentator will be able to overlook several obvious events. The war, the presidential election, and this billion-dollar enterprise, the New York World's Fair. And certainly the fair's motif is expressed by this amphitheater, the Court of Peace. What greater aim can man have than the Cezal of the Marbelt, the Ledbenas of Delbent, or the Cabochon of the Forbarn. Ladies and gentlemen, there can be none. That, I am sure, is what makes consideration of the fair's two seasons culminating in tonight all the more dreasy, all the more twaint, sled bar, and all the more Jennifer and impressive. And so I'm grateful to WOI for the opportunity to have stood where so many great brains have grouped and jubbled. It fills me with a great feeling of carbon, Trout and Delphmore. And so then, may I say, feel them and many, many blood drag. And so, with our little fun out of the way in the court of peace, 
Ladies and gentlemen, may I say that it has been fun because we all know the serious side of the Court of Peace and the New York Wells Fair. Tonight is not the night to tell you about that because we've enjoyed it for two years. It's over. It's been great fun. And so moving out of this theme center, which was really not the theme center, but which should have, had, should have been dedicated to peace and freedom, we take you to the Court of States and the New Jersey building. And this is Roger Bauer in the studio of the New Jersey building. And all these other fellows have been having the time of their lives doing the things they've always wanted to do during the fair. And I got cheated. I've been walking around this fair with a key that somebody gave me, trying to unlock boxes, and nothing happens. Other people have their keys, and they unlock boxes, and they find cars, and they're merry and happy, but not me. So I had intended to uh, see Mr. Harvey Gibson here tonight, the chairman of the board, and give him a key that won't open up anything either. But he cheated me. He left just a few minutes ago. However, we have another gentleman here that I'm very interested in. I'm sure you will be, too. Uh, Mr., uh, rather, Commander Howard Flanagan, who's an executive vice president of the uh, fair. Uh, Commander Flanagan, uh, how long have you been with the fair? Full two years? Oh, no, five. Five years. Are you tired of the fair now? No. You still like it, huh? No time to get tired. No time to get tired. Have you seen it, by the way? Every building, every exhibit. Every, every building and every exhibit. You've seen every building and every exhibit. And you like them all, too? I do. Boy, he's a diplomat. <laughs> well, I have tell, to be. <laughs> tell me, Commander, they tell me that you're in charge of the demolition of the fair. That's right. What is the demolition of the fair? We're going to clear away the buildings and structures so that Commissioner Moses can make the biggest park that the city of New York has ever had. Well, what you merely mean, that demolition, is you're going to wreck the fair after this. Huh? No, I'm just going to start help the Commissioner build a park. I see. What is it, what's it going to cost to tear the fair down? About a million dollars. Oh, you got stuck, Commander. Really, I could have done it for you for about a quarter of that. I have a seven-year-old son that just go right through here and tear everything down in a week. You're the fellow I'm looking for. <laughs> You're looking for him, rather. Well, Commander, uh, what are your plans after that? You well, just, pull a just going to wait and take a long rest someplace and lay in the sands or something? If the Navy will let me. Oh, I see. Back in the Navy. That's right. Well, we won't go into that right now, I don't think, have we? <laughs> well, here, too, in, the, in this little studio here is uh, George DeBenvo Kime, a chairman of the New Jersey uh, World's Fair Commission. And, Commander Kahn, what do you got to say about the fair here? As chairman of the New Jersey World's Fair Commission, I'm pleased and highly honored that the management of the 1940 fair has selected the smallest studio, uh, studio in the world for a part in the closing ceremonies of the greatest spectacle of its kind the world has ever seen. Well, that's all very nice, but between you and me, uh, Mr. Kahn, but <clears throat> do you think Mr. Gibson did a good job on this thing here? Okay. Huh? I welcome this opportunity to publicly extend to Mr. Harvey D. Gibson, chairman of the board of the fair, our thanks for the excellent cooperation which he and his able associates have given to us to make this the world's greatest fair, and to thank W.R. Mutual for cooperating, for operating the studio in the New Jersey building for the past two years. Well, that's fine. I, I said I got cheated with Mr. Gibson before, but they have some very beautiful girls around the New Jersey building, which I just wish I'd discovered before. Here's young. What's your name? Janet Landron. And what did you do here? I was hostess here at the New Jersey building. I must be blind. Well, I wish I... Did you have a good time? Oh, a wonderful Meet time. Meet lots of nice people, too, huh? Very nice people. Well, I'd like to talk to you, but I forgot. We left Henry Morgan at the other end of the fair trying to crash the American Jubilee. Henry, it's almost time to end this program. How are you doing over there? How am I doing? Why, it's the finale. You just got it back to me in time, and I've talked everybody into almost everything. I'm in the wings, and uh, my mic cord is absolutely free. Oh, they're all lined up, and here I am in my cute little sailor suit. Listen to this. I'm right out on the stage, and you can hear a speech. I'm one of the boys, see? I get myself all the way out on stage. This is wonderful. This is the official closing, you see? You can hear the speech through the PA system over my head. Can I get in line here, please? Pardon me. I'm in line. I'm on stage. All I have to do now is sing a song. That is a speech. I can't do it. Just a minute. Look out. Okay, I'm at the end of my line. Any chuckles you hear are my fellow sailors on stage with eight million people watching me. Can you hear the speech? Quiet. I've got my ambition. I'm on stage and at three minutes of twelve. How do you like the speech? It's Mr. Gibson. I don't know. I ought to keep my mouth shut. Can you hear it? Mr. Gibson is thanking everybody in the American Jubilee, and I guess he means me. I'm out here. 
Hey, you ought to see all the pretty dames, too. Thanking him on behalf of the corporation, or am I confusing him? I shouldn't be here, but they can fire me. He has a corporation. Yes, ma'am, I can see it from here. <laughs> I wonder what the audience thinks I'm doing. This is wonderful. Everybody has to be quiet but me. <laughs> this is wonderful. You have no idea. You have no idea what a listener at home thinks. I try to explain this to you. It's a tremendous stage, and I have my back to the audience, as all the other sailors and sailorettes have. And uh, it's just as well, yes. The commentary is from my fellow actors. Mr. Gibson is in the center of the stage with a spotlight on him, and uh, with soldiers and sailors and flags and whatnot. Oh, it's magnificent. But I should get to sing a song. I don't know. I'll have to wait till the end of the speech. I hope you can hear Mr. Gibson's speech. Things are going to be awful dull around your house if you can. <laughs> he says, Wait a minute. Oh, this is the sad part of the speech. I don't think I can get to sing my song. I don't know. I'll sing it to myself. Life is thrilling, life divine. As for me, I like it fine. Don't be sorrow, don't be blue. Things will be the nuts for you. Well, they can close the fair now. <laughs> and so, ladies and gentlemen, the New York World's Fair, on a note of comedy and hysteria, comes to an end. WOR Special Features Division has brought you a 35-minute roundup of the last night at the fair, with descriptions by WOR announcers letting loose their suppressed desires, doing just what they've always wanted to do at the fair, and really getting away with murder. And now it comes time to say so long to this great exposition, and knowing that among the many millions of Americans, memories of happy days spent at the fair will always remain. We close this program at the same time that the fair itself closes, 12 o'clock midnight, over the Trilon and Paris fair. Your announcer, Jerry Lawrence. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs>